Adventist Medical Evangelism Network motivates, trains, and equips healthcare professionals to share Christ with their patients. Many are desperately looking for that healing touch of faith, and we can help them find it. Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. What can you do in your practice for the Lord today? Welcome to our 17th Annual Amen Conference, While It Is Day. Well, morning, everyone. Glad to be here for our last session, and uh, praise God for what he has done. Has this not been an amazing weekend? Amen. Praise the Lord. I know I've been blessed by many of the presentations, and uh, glad I made the trip from the New England area all the way here to warm and sunny Palm Springs. Um, we're, we've got a lot to cover today. I'm just waiting for the slides to come up on the screen here. Um, and then we are going to, we're going to go into a pretty heavy subject today. Our, the title of our message today is Battle Ready. Battle Ready. And um, our scripture reading is taken from Jeremiah chapter 12. This is one of my favorite Bible verses. I, I quote it a lot in my messages. Um, Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse 5. The Bible says, if thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace, wherein thou trustest, they wearied thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of the Jordan? If in the land of peace, they wearied you, how will you do when the Jordan swells. Our message, this final presentation is entitled, Battle Ready. Battle Ready, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. And Once again, Lord, I ask that you just make me a nail on the wall, rusty, Lord, and seemingly useless. But Father God, upon that nail, we ask that you hang a portrait of Christ Jesus. Eric Walsh needs not be seen or heard. Instead, Father, let us hear a word from the throne room of grace. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to jump back to the book of Exodus. We're going to continue in our story from yesterday. Exodus chapter 32 and verse 7. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go get thee down for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. Now you remember Moses is up in the mountain. In fact, he's having uh, an, a kind of an interlude, an, in, an exchange with God. He's receiving the Ten Commandments written by the finger of God. Joshua is there with him. While he is absent during this time, the children of Israel have persuaded Aaron, who we learned yesterday, uh, the spirit of prophecy says, was pliant. And he participated in their sin when God realizes, and God knew what was happening, of course, but when he goes to tell Moses what's going on, he says, listen, uh, your people uh, have corrupted themselves. That is the word God used. They've corrupted themselves. He says in verse 8, Exodus 32 and verse 8, God says, they have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it. And have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. God says they turned quickly out of the way. It didn't take much. It didn't take long, Moses. Look how fast they reverted to the way they were before. And, and it's as if God is showing us something here. If we, if we use this as type, to the antitype of today, what you find is that it won't take much. And where we think folk are standing strong and we have trust and hope in, in, in whole sections of our denomination, it won't take much. They will turn quickly. The Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people and behold, it is a stiff naked people. And the, that stiff necked means that they won't turn in the direction of right. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may wax 
hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. So <laughs> I love what God does here. Uh, you might think that God is, is speaking to Moses that this is what should happen. I believe Moses is being tested. He says, listen, I'm upset. I'm going to wipe them all out. And Moses, I'm going to make a great nation out of just you. He's testing Moses to see if Moses is going to be merciful. If Moses is going to stand in the gap for his people. Because the rest of the work that Moses is going to have to do for the next 40 years will require him to prefer his own destruction rather than the destruction of God's people. This is a, it's, it's a turning point in Moses' ministry. That's why God gives him this test. And he says, listen, I'm going to destroy them all. Now, there are other people. God would have said this, and they would have said, listen, Lord, light, light them up. Light them up, Lord. I'll happily, I'll be the new Abraham. But instead, the Bible says that Moses besought the Lord as God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath hot, wax hot against your people? which you have brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. In other words, he said, wait a minute, can you be that angry? It's your people, and, and it's almost inferred here, God, didn't you know what they were like? Don't you know what would have happened to them all those years in Egypt? They, are, they, are, they were corrupted when we went to get them. But I like what Moses does. He said, listen, why should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn away thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. He says instead, listen, God, I'm not trying to let our enemies look like they were the victors. I'm not trying to give this over to the Egyptians. He said, listen, turn your wrath and repent of what you're planning to do to your people. Moses in this place begins to represent, we'll see it more as the story goes on. He represents a type of Christ. He literally says, listen, I would, no, I don't want to be the star. We need to save your people. And then he goes into the scripture. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants? to whom you swore by your own self and said unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have spoken of him will I give unto your seed and they shall inherit it forever. He says, don't you remember what you told your people? And here's the kicker. It says here, and the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Now some people say God, God really can't repent. What God, what God does here is he turns the direction. He is going to deal with sin, but he, has, he lets Moses know that Moses' approach is the correct approach. Now watch this. Now Moses has to go and deal with the people. And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony which were in his hand, the tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other were they written. So here it is. This is the, the very test of, uh, uh, tables that God had written. And we always picture the, the Ten Commandments as written on one side of, 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 one, of, of the stone, but really it looks like the, it wrapped around the stone. And here Moses is carrying this thing down. Um, and it says in verse 16, and the tables were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. It is, this, is, this is so uh, important when you, to understand when dealing with God's law and how immutable it is. It was God himself. Moses did not write the Ten Commandments. It was the very finger of God that <laughs> engraved upon stone the Ten Commandments. This is the first time in the Bible that God writes. And, it be, and, and of course, the, the symbolism is that if he writes it in stone, writing in stone is permanent. If you go to archaeological digs in Israel today, they still pull up pieces of stone with things written on them, and you can still read what is there. Things like the Rosetta Stone. They, they, this is to say that God's law is immutable. It is permanent. Just out of interest, the second time God's write, God writes is in the book of Daniel. At the feast, the king of Babylon failed to do what God wanted him to do. And, 
and used the very vessels out of the, out of the temple and drank and wine out of them and, and praised the gods of, of stone and wood and, and gold and, and, and they're having this great feast and all of a sudden a hand appears out of nowhere and up on the plaster of the side of the banquet hall it is written, meeny, meeny, tikalu farsin. You have been weighed in the balances and what? And found wanting. The second time God writes, he writes based on the judgment, judgment based on what he wrote the first time. You violated the law. You knew better. That's part of the story. Your, your, your grandfather was converted. Nebuchadnezzar was converted. You know the truth. And yet you live like this. It's over. The third time God writes. A woman is caught in the act of adultery. And Jesus, being God, John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, being God, when they brought this woman naked and ashamed and threw her down next to Jesus and asked, Should she be stoned? Jesus begins to just write the sins of those who accuse her in the sand, in the dust of the ground. And as they begin to realize that their cover is blown from the eldest to the youngest, they begin to take away. God, in the, in the person of Christ Jesus, has written their sin in the stand, the sin that they committed based on the Ten Commandments, which were written in stone. Now their sin is written in the dust of the ground, and they all take off, and Jesus is left alone with the woman, and he says, uh, where are thou accusers? She says, I have none. Jesus says, neither do I condemn thee. Do what? Go and sin no more. He upholds the first time he write by, wrote by saying, don't sin. But you know the beauty of the third time he writes? That he can just take his foot and wipe away sin. The law is immutable. Sin is removable. God wrote the Ten Commandments. This is important to our message today to understand that the world is going to try to change these Ten Commandments. Out of this story, we get how important the Ten Commandments are because without the law, we would not know sin. If there is no law, if the law has been done away with, there's no need for a Savior. I like Joshua. Joshua's up there doing God's work with Moses. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. Joshua said, listen, we're at war. They're fighting down there. Come on, we got to go help. And he said, it is not, this is the Moses, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery. Neither is the voice of them that cry for being overcome. But the noise of them that sing do I hear. We talked about music the first night. Music was a part of this um, corruption that happened. Exodus 32 and verse uh, 19 says, And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the calf. Moses coming down from the mountain. He sees this golden calf. He sees them dancing and partying around the calf, uh, drinking and carrying on. The script, so Moses was defending God, you know, saying to God, Hey, don't get so mad at your people. But what happens when Moses sees what they're doing? The Bible says Moses' anger waxed hot. Isn't that interesting? It's a good thing Moses and God didn't have this discussion at the same time. And maybe that's why God spoke to Moses about it before Moses saw it. <laughs> and he cast the tables out of his hand and break them beneath the mount. It represented, when Moses threw it down and broke those tables, it represented that the people of God had smashed, they had broken God's commandments. I like what Moses does in verse 20. He takes the calf, which they had made, and he burnt it with fire and ground it to powder. This is where the story gets crazy. And he strawed upon the water, strawed it upon the water, and he made the children of Israel drink the golden calf. Some of y'all have green smoothies in the morning. They had a golden smoothie. You know why, they, why, why Moses did this? It was custom, and it still is. If you go to certain, especially if you're vegan, you go to certain restaurants, and they will, 
they'll have a sta- an idol, a statue of an idol. And what do they put in front of it? Food. You were to feed the idol. The apis was to be fed by the people. What Moses does is he takes the idol and he makes them consume it to show them that the idol was and is powerless. They drank it. But I like this line. He turns to his brother Aaron. I'm sure Moses at this point scratching his head. Man, I left you for just a little while. Look at the chaos that's happening. Right? And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? How did they bewitch you, Aaron, that you would follow them and allow such a horrible thing to happen? Let me tell you something, this resonates to our day. We must be sure that when the time comes, we stand for what is right. We cannot be like Aaron. You see, remember what happened. Um, they turned, those that stood up against the, 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 the forming and the, and the creating of this golden calf, uh, those that stood up and said, you know, this is idolatry, we ought not do it. Spirit of prophecy we read yesterday said that they turned on them and took some of their lives. Here's what the spirit of prophecy says about Aaron. Aaron fared for his own safety. And instead of nobly standing up for the honor of God, he yielded to the demands of the multitude. Ah, when the time comes, we are going to have to make a decision. Do we choose our own safety or do we stand up for the principles of God? This is why Jeremiah says what he says in the verse that we just read. If right now we are not standing up for God in little things, if right now the Sabbath catches us getting our last minute shopping done every week, if right now on the Sabbath our conversation drifts to sports or or Wall Street or other things that ought not be discussed on the Sabbath, if right now we are not able to to, 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 to be careful as to what we let into our bodies, if we are uh, 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 by spectatorship participating in the sins of Hollywood, if right now we can't stand up when it's just footmen running, how will we keep up when the day the horses prophetically start to run? We've got to begin now to become battle ready because a time is coming. Here's what Spirit of Prophecy says. From Eternity Past, page 221, continued, uh, Sister White says, The people proclaimed, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And Aaron basely permitted this insult to Jehovah. He uh, he did more. Seeing what, what satisfaction the golden God was received, he built an altar before it and made proclamation, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. She says, The people proclaimed, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And Aaron basely permitted this insult to Jehovah. They said, these be thy gods. Aaron didn't stop there. He then goes on to make that uh, altar. She says, and they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and uh, to eat and rose up to play. Here's the line that is critical to last day events. She says here, they gave themselves up to gluttony and licentious reveling. It was not just that there was a golden calf. It was the, it was the gestalt of the situation. The idea that here they had escaped Egypt now and now they wanted to just let loose and, and have a good time. There are a whole lot of Christians who think we are in a time of celebration. No, no, no. We are in a time of the pre-advent judgment. This is a time for us to be cautious and careful. There are a lot of folk running around celebrating a victory they have not yet gained. Verse 25. Exodus 32 and verse 25. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, this is where it gets crazy, the people had stripped naked, eaten, drinking, dance and carry on. 
For Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. So the, the enemies are seeing this asking, I thought these were different type of people. I didn't know they were just like us. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. He says, who is on the Lord's side? Let me tell you something. There's going to be a shaking, a separation, a, di a dividing line where in this time, people are going to have to make up their mind, whose side are they on? And the Levites would go on to become priests. And I want to submit to you, I'm doing a, a series at my church on the sanctuary. And one of the things that I found powerful is that you can't stay in the outer courtyard. You can't just say what a brazen altar is and a brazen laver. As Christians, we move beyond just the, the, what happened at the cross and at the burial and resurrection of Christ. But we, the Bible says, we become a royal priesthood. Each one of us must then move into the holy place and begin to work with God. There's a point where you make a decision in your mind. Even Sister White talks about the fact that some will stay in the courtyard. But we are each called to be kings and priests with God. That means we are each to sanctify ourselves. We're each supposed to go in. The Levites gathered themselves with him. In verse 27, and he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, put every man his sword by his side. The Levites get their swords out. The sword represents the word of God. And go in and out from the gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. Verse 28, and the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. They went out and they began to take out those who were so quick to engage in idolatry and licentiousness, those who were that fast to move away from the precepts of God. The Levites deal with them because the Levites were battle ready. Now watch this. The four things... And make being battle ready and the Levites so impressive and important to me. Number one, they did not participate in false worship. When it came to, 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 to worship the golden calf, it was the Levites as a group that stood out in pulling back and saying we will not participate in this. Number two, they had their swords ready. And again, the sword represents the word of the living God. If we are to be battle ready in times one, we cannot participate in false worship. And let me tell you something, a time is about to come when each of us will be tested. We're already being tested, but a global test will come. But number three, they were willing to remove sin, to stand up and remove sin. And number four, when God said, this is the work that must be done, they obeyed the word of God. They were battle ready. You see, if you can't keep up now, if right now we can't witness to our neighbors in kindness, and let me tell you something, when I, I, I'm working with one of the churches in New York, they're doing, a, they're doing a evangelism training over, over the next few weeks, and last week I was, last weekend I spent the weekend with them. One of the things when you study evangelism, building relationships is important. If we are going to, if we are unable to build relationships with folk now, to witness to them, do you think we're going to be able to build relationships when times get really difficult? Now is the time, listen, when, when, when COVID lockdown happened, all our, everyone was out walking. It was amazing. Our neighborhood, people were walking. We got to know all our neighbors, their pets, everybody. We got to know them all. And because of that, we began to be able to share. We gave, we gave one group, the Days of Noah, that, the documentary. We were able to give some folk the great controversy and step to Christ. All of a sudden, by building relationship, the door opened up and we were able to share. I want to submit to you that sometimes we think the last days, uh, the, the, the focus is on the most difficult thing. But one of the most basic things to do is build relationship. That's why the work that Amen does is so important. Because through the work of medical ministry, through reaching people when they're sick or dying, or when their family members in that condition, the, the, the place where they are spiritually is often a place where they're willing to listen and hear, especially when you have shown them kindness outside of trying to doctrinally influence or encourage them. I've had many a patient who does not believe in God, who's gotten a bad diagnosis or in a, or in a terrible situation. And in that moment, I'm able to share God 
I've prayed with people who do not believe in God and watched this tears stream down their face as they have asked, do you really think God would hear my prayer? The work that we are to do is a work that we need to do now because time is running out. Let's look at some of the prophecy. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not what? Yet. Now when I look at this, I see the last century as a century of war. World War I, World War II, Vietnam, Korea. Um, there were uh, wars for, to shake off colonial rule. All kinds of wars happened last, last century. But that was not the end. The warning is that, don't worry, when the wars cease like that, keep looking. Because what happens next? Then nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. The next phase is that these things will happen. One of the great lines there I like to highlight is nation will rise against nation. The word uh, there for uh, uh, nation in the Greek is the word ethnos. It is the word from which we get ethnicity. The scripture is telling us that in the world, racial tensions will only increase. Wow. Which means, as a church, the better we are able to come together in unity, regardless of where everyone comes from or looks like, we will stand out in the world. I believe if we are, I believe we are probably, if not the most diverse of all denominations, we are close. It is a testament when brethren can dwell together in unity. The whole world can't figure it out. That means the people of God must figure it out. Then, verse 8, Jesus tells his disciples, all these are the beginning of sorrows. COVID, just the beginning. The earthquakes that we're seeing, just the beginning. It's going to get worse. We're going to have to be battle ready because what happens next? Well, according to Matthew 24 and verse 9, there's a pivot. When you see all this chaos and destruction in the world, the activism that will come from nation rising against nation, then the Bible says in Matthew 24 and verse 9, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Let me tell you what happens. When the, when the world sees the chaos, and we're going to get into prophetically what that chaos is going to look like. When it starts to see the world itself unraveling, the pestilence, the earthquakes, the natural disasters. As folks start to try and fight for individual rights as it begins to happen uh, around the globe. At some point, it turns, and all the world's attention focuses on those who keep the commandments of God, who call Christ Jesus their Savior. Something happens, and the whole world pivots. In fact, Jesus goes on in Matthew 24, and he says in verse 21, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And look at what the Bible says here. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be what? Shortened. We are living in a time that we've got to be, we, we've got to be battle ready because it is going to get so bad that for, the, for our sake... For the sake of those who are, are, are belong to Christ Jesus, God himself is going to say, okay, we've got to shorten the time. What is going to happen to change the world? Is it coronavirus? Let me tell you something, it's a whole lot deeper than coronavirus. First of all, this is from the Los Angeles Times. This is an article that they had online. It says, climate change is accelerating, bringing the world dangerously close to irreversible change. You're going to hear, and some folks say, well, climate change isn't real. It is. I don't know that it matters if it's real or not. What matters is what they're going to do about it, right? So climate change, they say, listen, this is all the stuff that's happening. The, 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 the next article um, shows global sizzling. July was the hottest month on record, according to one of the agencies. So they said this year we had the hottest month. I don't know, it wasn't that hot in Connecticut, but it was clearly hot everywhere else. Hottest month on record. 
And so now they're saying bad things are happening. You hear more and more about the sea tides rising and all the different things that are happening. And so they're moving into a space where they're saying we are in a climate emergency. Here's what the Pope says. Pope Francis, in an Earth Day message earlier this year, warns we are at the edge on climate change. There was a movie they made that said the day after tomorrow. Now here's what's interesting. The Bible is warning us that time is short and that we need to get ready. I find it fascinating that the world is saying that time is short. Don't miss this. Remember Revelation chapter 12, Satan has come down among you having great wrath because he, has, he knows he has what? Short time. Isn't it interesting that the devil and his forces know they have a short time and the people of God act like we have all the time in the world? He says with climate change we are on the edge. That's what the Pope says. Here, Pope urges politicians to take drastic measures on climate change. Um, um, Pope this is from the Vatican City, Rudis reported this. Pope Francis uh, challenged governments to take drastic measures to combat global warming and reduce the use of fossil fuel. So listen, we got to take drastic measures. And here's where it gets interesting. Biden and Pope Francis could make a climate change miracle. I'm not saying anything. This is all just headlines. And I want you to see how it fits into prophecy. Something has to happen. This is why this is in Matthew 24, verse 8. All these are the beginning of sorrows. There's a pivot at Matthew 24, 8, because when you get to Matthew 24, verse 9, persecution comes against the people of God. Something happens in the world that switches the world from fighting amongst itself to targeting Bible-believing Christians. Maybe we're starting to see what at least part of that will be. Here's uh, Biden and the Pope meeting this week for 90 minutes. They met and talked. The, first, the second Catholic um, president of the United States, a big fan. In fact, the U.S. bishops are angry that the Pope said, listen, you should take communion because the U.S. bishops are like, wait a minute, he's not against abortion. And because he's not against abortion, he shouldn't be able to take uh, communion uh, uh, or mass. I should say mass. Uh, mass. And so the Pope said, no, you, you can have mass. But what does he get in return for mass? They're going to really push an agenda to change uh, fossil fuel use and uh, carbon dioxide production. I don't hear much about methane production, which is happening because of the way the amount of meat we eat in this world and the way they feed the meat antibiotics. It's not just that people eat a lot of meat. There have always been animals on the planet. It's the fact that they give them all these antibiotics, antibiotics which changes the gut flora of these animals, so they produce methane that actually does harm the environment. But they seem to focus on cars more than meat. Not sure why. Here we go. So Europe is really pushing this thing. The European Sunday Alliance is working. And here's where it gets interesting. If you start to look at what is coming together to do this, one, they say, listen, we need people to keep Sunday because it's good for their health. We need people to keep Sunday. And what they talk about is a coordinated, look at that, the right to disconnect and the need for a European weekly common day of rest. One, it will protect your health. Two, it will help the family. Are you starting to see how this comes together? Um, and then three, let us live together, the environment. But there's another component that are, that's the labor unions in Europe and the churches. You are finding people across the political spectrum. And Europe isn't like America where we have two parties, a blue one and a red one, the Bloods and the Crips. I mean, the Democrats and the Republicans. <laughs> Just two parties. They have multiple parties. They are far more politically diverse in opinion. What you're finding happening in Europe is much more difficult to be done than it would be in America with, all, with the fact that we just have two parties. So here's where it gets interesting. The labor unions are fighting so that workers don't work. Churches and family organizations are fighting so families can be together, right? You have, uh, you have um, environmentalists fighting so that we protect the environment by keeping Sunday sacred and by having a Sunday Sabbath. Then you have animal rights folks saying, listen, maybe we can convince people not to eat meat on 
a Sunday. I mean, so you start to see that across the spectrum, people are beginning to line up. And here's what maybe we never thought about before. This is not simply a religious move. In order to take secular Europe to keeping a Sunday Sabbath, it cannot simply be religious. There's got to be other things that come together to do it. And when we talk in America about the great resignation that is happening right now and the up, uh, uprising that we're seeing among workers demanding more, I think you're going to see that some of what's happening there will shift here because it's not Europe that launches the mark of the beast, it's us. But guess what? You got to have a pilot program you got to find a place to work out the details. And I believe that's what's happening. You can look up these websites and read. It's pretty fascinating. This one here is the National Catholic Register, an American print. They say, listen, taking Sunday seriously, Poland leads the way. This is an older article. It says the European nation's new law sharply restricting Sunday shopping provides an opportunity to take closer look at American habits. And you know what's funny? If you go online, people ridicule Adventists for believing that there is an agenda to, for a Sunday law. They say, we're foolish. What kind of crazy conspiracy theorists believe that there's a Sunday law agenda? But it's, 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 not, I mean, it's not a very well-hidden conspiracy. It's all over the papers. This, this whole website's dedicated to it. There are people who s clearly want this to happen. And this, let me tell you something. I, I'm a preacher who's preached, and preaching can get you in trouble. But guess what? Somebody's got to stand up and say it. Somebody's got to remind us that this is what's coming. And yes, we're going to be ridiculed for believing it. Of course the world is going to turn against us. Just like they made that golden calf and danced naked around it, violating the law of God and pressured everyone else in Israel to do the same. We are living in those types of days where somebody's got to be like the Levites and stand up and be battle ready. And say, I will stand on thus, saith the Lord, regardless of what that means. There's the Pope. I'm telling you, with all the religious leaders, you can see people from different, they're not even, this is not even Christian leaders. If you look at just what's on everyone's head, the different things they're wearing on their head, you see every type of religion represented in the world. As the Pope convinces them, listen, we've got to push for environmental change. So much so has this happening that now you have the Climate Sunday. Who is organizing Climate Sunday? And you can see here, they, they talk about the churches. They're going to have a Sunday before the big uh, COP26 meeting around the environment. And they're going to have a Sunday where all the churches in the United Kingdom are going to come together. And this is what the sermons are all going to be on. Everyone is going to talk about this. Christian churches holding Climate Sunday ahead of Glasgow Conference. They are going to push, and I should have put the thing up here, but they're going to push for what they call, some are going to call it a green Sabbath on Sundays. They're going to talk all the different ways that they can describe it. But I hope you see that this is not some small piece of anything. The Catholic Church, in league with the European Union, is working very hard and has been for years to move Sunday legislation forward in Europe and change the way Europe rests on the weekend. Spirit of Prophecy says trade unions will be one of the, the, one of the agencies that will bring upon the, this earth a time of trouble such has not been since the world began. The work of the people of God is to prepare for the events of the future, which will soon come upon them with blinding force. I mentioned the trade unions, and there are a lot of good things the trade unions have done. I don't want to speak as if I think unions are just inherently have not done any good. The way our work week is, the time off, the, we owe a lot of that to unions. But when the time comes, they will be leveraged as part of this, 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 this group, uh, this, this kind of consortium uh, of forces to push for Sunday sacredness. In fact, the bishops have chimed in with this. This is Vatican News, the European Union, the bishops call for nations to protect a work-free Sunday. We're ridiculed for believing what we've been teaching for decades. But here's what the Spirit of Prophecy says in the Great Controversy. Page 590, Spirit of Prophecy, Ellen White says, And then the great deceiver will persuade men 
that those who serve God are causing these evils. What evils? The evils of Matthew chapter 24 and verse 7. The class that have provoked the displeasures, the displeasure of heaven, will charge all their troubles upon those whose obedience to God's commandments is a perpetual reproof to transgressors. Did you get that? Those who hold fast to what was written in stone by the finger of God, they will be blamed for all the evil happening in the world. Can that happen? Let me tell you something. The one, one of the most terrible things that came out of coronavirus is that there were certain ethnic groups that were being blamed for the coronavirus coming into the world. How terrible that was. There's precedence that in this world it is not difficult for people to quickly turn and blame one small group of people. In fact, she goes on to say, it will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath. It will be declared. They are, by, they're, they're, they're angering God. And then they will say this, Great Controversy, page 590, continued that this sin has brought calamities. What sin? The sin of violating the Sunday law. That this sin has brought calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance shall be strictly enforced. And that those who present the, the claims of the fourth commandment, thus destroying reverence for Sunday, are troublers of the people preventing their restoration to divine favor and temporal prosperity. Just like with coronavirus, they said, listen, do whatever it takes to make things go back to the way they were. After 9-11, do whatever it takes to make things go back to the way they were. Now they're going to say, do whatever it takes. That is Sunday legislation and its enforcement on a few people, do it. Would people really think this way? Well, just recently, one Mississippi senator, when they were looking at changing the voting bills in Mississippi so people could vote on Sunday, the Mississippi senator suggests Sunday voting will offend God. So there are those who honestly believe that if you get Sunday and keep and it, and it, and it, and it, and you and you put it in a place of sacredness, that if you do certain things on Sunday, you offend God. Just as the spirit of prophecy said. Now, small example here. We'll see what happens as it starts to work out. Christian service, page 158. The work which the church has failed to do in a time of peace and prosperity. This is running with the footmen. She will have to do in a terrible crisis under most discouraging, forbidding circumstances. The warnings that worldly conformity have silenced or withheld must be given under the fiercest opposition from enemies of the faith. Did you get that? Well, I think one of the most frightening part of that is where she says, the warnings that worldly conformity has silenced or withheld. Our desire to conform to the world, to not offend anyone, to never step outside of the bounds, to only uh, uh, speak those things that, that, that are acceptable and politically correct. Because the church has decided to do that when it was just footmen running. And that's why there's going to be a great shaking. Within a lot of folk, they'll be like, no, I will not speak of thus saith the Lord. Here's what she says, at that time, and at that time, the superficial conservative class whose influence has steadily retarded the progress of the work will renounce the faith and take their stand with its avowed enemies toward whom their sympathies have long been tending. In other words, when this happens, those in the church who really have always wanted to move the church in a direction away from biblical purity, those will, who've always kind of wanted a church to be a little bit more like the world, they will leave the church and will become the fiercest enemies of the people of God. She says, those apostates will then manifest the most bitter enmity doing all in their power to oppress and malign their former brethren and excite indignation against them. This day, church, is just before us. 
let me appeal to the remnant church of the living God. Do not allow pandemics, do not allow racial tension in this country, do not allow any of it to cause us to lose our unity. Last summer, it was, it was, it was racial uh, tensions and the church began to fissure. This summer, it was vaccines and the church begins to fissure. Is it so easy for Satan to break up the house of God? What will it be next summer? Do we not realize that it is Satan who is manipulating us? Because a church divided cannot do the work of the living God? Like the nine disciples left in the valley when a man brought his son possessed with a demon, could not cast out the demon while Christ was on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, it was because of their envy and jealousy of Peter, James, and John who went up in the mountain and because they were divided, because they were envious, they were also spiritually powerless. By this men will know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. How quickly we turn on one another over non-salvific emotional things. She says the experience which would have helped them in this emergency they have neglected to obtain. And their souls are burdened with remorse for wasted opportunities and neglected privileges. One day we will, we will be uh, being persecuted and will turn to one another and say, man, all the time we wasted discussing issues that ultimately did not matter. All the conferences and long weekends we had discussing stuff that had nothing to do with anything. This is why the scripture says in Matthew 24 as well in verse 13, yeah, persecution's going to come, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be what? The same shall be saved. The Christian race is not a sprint. It's a cross-country run. And I mean cross the country. It is a long-term thing. This is not something you get up and you just do it. This takes every day. That's why the scripture says a just man falls seven times and rises every time. It says that because the, the race is so long that you might trip and fall. You might make mistakes. You may do things that are not pleasing to God. But what God is asking for you to do is get up every single time. You have not gone so far that God has forgotten you. In fact, here's, look at how God deals with the children of Israel. Verse 29, for Moses had said, consecrate yourselves today to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves. They had to go and wash and consecrate themselves to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. God went from wrath, Moses went from wrath to consecration and blessing. This is the way God deals with his people if they will turn from their sin. Verse 30, and it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord Peradventure, I shall make an atonement for your sin. Type, Moses now says, listen, I'm going to try and stand in the gap for you. Just as Christ did for us. Verse 31, and Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin. And there's a weird punctuation in the King James Version. I don't think you see it anywhere else in the Bible. As if Moses is just pleading and it pauses the the scripture comes to a pause as Moses pleads for his people. And if not, he says, blot me, I pray thee, out of the book which you have written. Which book is that? The book of life. You know, Moses said, listen, save your people. If you can't save them, then blot me out. Take my life, but spare your people. Ah, he stands as a type of Christ here. This is what Jesus did for us. But I love what God responds. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Listen, I'm not blotting out the innocent. God's like, it don't work like that. He says, therefore now, 
Go, lead the people unto the place which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. They suffered the plague. Ah, they suffered the pestilence. You know, when the, when the, when the, when the ten, um, when the ten um, plagues fell on Egypt, the first three affected Israel and Egypt. See, this is one of the... But the last seven plagues, the seven last plagues, only affected Egypt. See, in Revelation, there's going to be seven last plagues. I believe we are in one of the first three to an extent. God plagued his people as a way to remind them that they need to follow him, to humble them. This thing should humble us. What's going on with coronavirus? It ought to humble us. It ought not make us arrogant. It ought not make us prideful. I hear some of them, well, we have the health message. So we don't have to work. Our health message shouldn't make us arrogant and proud. It should make us humble. Make us want to share it. But I love how, the, how, how Paul puts it. The children of Israel sinned that great, and yet God consecrated them, blessed them. The angel of God led them, and he restored them. And he led them all the way into the promised land, ultimately. Well, this generation had to die off, but their, their offspring get into the promised land. We in this, we are there. And here's the consecration. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. This is a frightening passage of scripture. Look at what it says. It says, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Paul goes on to say in verse 10, not, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And when I read this, you're shook because you say, Lord, I have sinned great sin in my life. How can I be saved? Is there any hope? Will I ever make it into the promised land? You start, the devil starts to remind, he's the accuser of the brethren. He starts to remind you of your mess, your sin, your faults, your failures. He starts to bring it all back to you. This is part of what will happen during the time of trouble, during Jacob's time of trouble specifically, that we are going to have to wrestle with all of this. But I want to remind you, I want to end my part of this conference on 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 11. Paul says something profound that resonates for each one of us. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 11 Paul says, and such were some of you. In the past tense, you are no longer an alcoholic in Christ Jesus. No longer a fornicator, a sinner of whatever type. In Christ Jesus, you have been made brand new. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. But ye are washed, remember? consecrate yourselves. You are washed, you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. I want to leave you with the fact that as we head into these terrible times of trouble, it's going to be very easy for the devil to try and convince us. In fact, there's one great passage with the Spirit of Prophecy where Ellen White talks about how the devil is going to try and remind us of everything we did. And, and those who fall prey to, his, to him constantly telling you how terrible you are or were, they will begin to slide away and go back into their old life. And, and she says that this will prepare them to receive the mark of the beast. Let me tell you something. As my wife comes up to sing, let me tell you something. The blood of Jesus Christ still washes. It still cleanses. Just as Moses consecrated the children of Israel and just as the Spirit of God still fell upon them, just as they were able to move on from this, let me tell you something, as time gets tough, he still washes us. And church, it is by his blood that we will stand in the time of trouble. Love sent my Savior to die in my stead. Why 
should he love me so? Meekly to Calvary's cross he was led. Why should he love me so? Why should he love me so? Why should he should my Savior to Calvary go? Why should he love me so? Nails pierced his hands and his feet for my sin. Why should he love me so? He suffered sore my salvation to win. Why should he love me so? Why should he love me so? Why should he love me so? Why should my Savior to should he love me so nothing withholding my sin to efface why should he love me so why should he love me so why should he should my Savior to Calvary go? Why should he love me so? Why should my Savior to our heads for prayer. Father God, we thank you for your truth and for your word and the warnings and instructions therein. Lord, we thank you for the sure word of prophecy. We thank you, Lord, that you loved us so. Father God, we pray today that the Spirit of God would move upon each one of us and upon our entire church that we would be a people who are battle ready. Lord, we know difficult times are ahead of us, but Lord, we also know that we serve a God who is able to keep us even through the most difficult times. So Father God, let each of us gain hope and encouragement and strength. And Father God, what we are seeing now is simply the last signs before our Father comes to Redeem us from this earth. Help us, Lord, to be faithful and true in all things and in all ways because you loved us so. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.